uh, important thing. Good evening, Anurag. Thank you, Simran. Thank you, Shantanu. Right. So, uh, what I want to say here is that uh, uh, building and coalition disorder is a very important topic, especially when it comes to the AIMS exam. Recently, what I have observed that many of the uh, questioning AIMS exam they are asking from this area, right? Which you will see in my discussion also. And it is a little bit conceptual also. So, try to listen to me, and you will definitely get question in exam. It's not only AIMS. All exam you will be getting some question from here. It will be helping you, right? So, first of all, we should know that when we talk about the building and coalition disorder, first thing what we should understand when we are seeing a blood vessel, right? They are lined by endothelial lining, right? So, blood vessel is lining by endothelium. So there is an endothelial lining, and remember this endothelial lining is smooth. Point number one, endothelial lining is smooth, and second, they are having glycocalyx coating also. Glyco, glycocalyx coating, right? So endothelial lining and glycocalyx coating, which is present in the blood vessel, right? This is the usual feature. This is the normal feature in a normal blood vessel, and that is why there is no spontaneous clotting in a normal blood vessel. This is the question in the PG exam also, right? So remember why there is no clotting in a normal blood vessel. Examiner will be asking you question why there is why there is no clotting, no clotting in normal blood vessel. So this is the answer. No clotting in normal blood vessel because of endothelial lining, which is covered by glycocalyx coating. That was the question which I've been asked very frequently, and we should know it in normal situation also. Why? Why we are not getting any coagulation in a normal condition because of the smooth endothelium, and that is the glycocalyx coating, which will not allow any platelet attachment or any clot factor activation. That is why there is a no clotting, right? So this is one important point which we learned here, right? Now next, I am going to tell you. <coughs> next important point, what I am going to tell you is about the trauma to the blood vessel. See, what I am going to discuss here. Suppose this is the blood vessel, right? So there are two types of injuries you can expect in any blood vessel. It can be a minor injury or it can be a major injury, right? So whenever there is a minor cut. Right, minor cut. What will happen after the minor cut? Bleeding will stop spontaneously. So there will be a spontaneous stoppage of the bleeding. A spontaneous stoppage of the bleeding. Why? That is the question. Right. So why? Why there is a very good manner. Uh, you are very right. It is because of the reflex vasoconstriction. Right. So remember this. This is spontaneous stoppage is because of the reflex vasoconstriction. Remember, it is because of the reflex vaso. Constriction, right? So that is the important point about the minor cut. Remember, whenever we are talking about the minor cut, why bleeding stops spontaneously because of the reflex vasoconstriction, right? So that was the answer in exam, right? That was the answer in exam. Whenever there is a minor cut to the blood vessel, bleeding stops spontaneously because of the reflex vasoconstriction. See now, look at this scenario. Who is inducing this reflex vasoconstriction? Who is responsible for this reflex vasoconstriction? Yes, very good, Manohar. It is because of the endothelium hormone released from the damaged endothelium. Remember, it is due to this reflex vasoconstriction is due to endothelium. It is due to endothelium, right? So this reflex vasoconstriction is due to endothelium because of the endothelium released from the damaged endothelium. They are going to they are going to cause reflex vasoconstriction and bleeding will stop, right? So now you can see that the stoppage of the bleeding in a minor cut is very simple, right? Let us discuss about the major cut. What will happen in the major cut? Whenever there is a major cut, the blood vessel bleeding will stop spontaneously. But how, right? So now we are going to discuss about the major cut. How bleeding will stop here? So here it is not like that. It is stopping spontaneously, right? It is stopping spontaneously in minor cut. But here there will be a different mechanism. Here there will be a different mechanism which I am going to discuss on the next page, right? Look at this blood vessel, which is lined by endothelium, and here I am showing you this is the major cut. Right, and below the endothelium, I'm just taking another color. Below the endothelium, there will be collagen. Right, so because of this damage, now this collagen had been exposed. Right, so below this, there is a collagen, and now this collagen had been exposed. Because of this exposure of the collagen, what will happen? They will attach to the platelet. Platelet. This platelet will attach to the another platelet. Right, so this is how platelet, 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 primary hemostatic plug has been formed. Right, but remember, this platelet, platelet, primary hemostatic plug is unstable. Means it's a weak. Coming blood can destroy them. So whatever blood is coming, it will destroy this. Right, so they will not be sustained for long time. For the sustenance, what what should happen? This platelet will be activated. See, this platelet is activated. Platelet will be activated, and on activation, on activation, they will release fibrin. So this is the fibrin, right? So they will release fibrin. So this is the fibrin which I have made, right? So this is the fibrin. What I have made here, this is the fibrin, right? So this fibrin will be like a cement, and now they will be giving the they will be giving us stability, right? So this fibrin plus platelet, right? So now what we are seeing, this fibrin plus platelet will be forming the secondary hemostatic plug, and bleeding will stop, right? So this is the simple basic concept of the major cut. So whatever I have said, now I am going to write it, right? So uh, here we have to remember what is going to happen in major cut. So we were talking about the major cut. So after major cut, what I have said, collagen will be exposed. Right, so subendothelial. So this is subendothelial collagen which has been exposed. They are going to combine with platelet. Right, this platelet is going to combine with another platelet. <coughs> and remember, this platelet-platelet combination, this platelet-platelet combination will be activating the platelet. And now platelet will have two granules, alpha and delta, and they will start releasing clot factor. Remember, this is very important MCQ which I am telling you. Every platelet they have two important granules. See, this is the platelet, and platelet is having two granules, alpha and delta. Alpha granule has factor five, factor eight, fibrinogen, right, calcium, and delta granule will be having ADP, histamine, serotonin. Right, calcium will be present in the data granule, right? So just remember like this. So you can see that this is how uh, you you can see this is how you will be seeing the platelet has been activated, right? And when they are activated, they are releasing all this clot factor, right? All this clot factor and vasoconstrictor. So because what will happen? This will activate the coagulation pathway. This will activate the coagulation pathway. So when coagulation pathway is activated, what will happen? Fibrin will be formed, right? So fibrin will be formed. So now you can see fibrin has been formed. Now look at this again. I repeat again. What I have told you after the major cut, what has happened? Platelet platelet has formed the plug, right? This platelet platelet plug is called as primary hemostatic plug. Primary hemostatic plug. So this is called as primary hemostatic plug. So if examiner asks you, what is primary hemostatic plug consisting of? It is consisting of platelet only, right? So primary hemostatic plug will be consisting of platelet only. Now you can see when this platelet was activated, they have released the clot factor from their alpha and delta granule, which has started coagulation pathway, and fibrin has been formed. So this fibrin now it will cementify this. It will stabilize the platelet. So fibrin plus platelet plus platelet. So this entire thing will be called as secondary hemostatic plug. This is called as secondary 
hemostatic plug. Right, so now you can see there are two plugs: primary hemostatic plug and secondary hemostatic plug. Primary hemostatic plug consists of only platelet. Secondary hemostatic plug will be consisting of both platelet and fibrin. So now this is clot, and clot has been formed. Bleeding will stop. So that is how bleeding will stop. Right. So this is how uh, we have to understand the concept of major cut. Right. So what I have shown you here, I have shown you about the major cut. Whenever there is a major cut, how bleeding will stop? This is how it will stop. Right. Platelet will be attached to the subendothelial collagen. Right. And after that, next platelet will come. There will be uh, when the platelet-platelet interaction starts, they will start releasing their alpha and beta granules. And these granules are having clot factors. These clot factors will activate coagulation pathway, and you know that coagulation pathway fibrin will be formed, and this fibrin will stop the bleeding. Right. So that is how you can see this will how we stop the bleeding by combining with platelet. So remember, examiner may ask question like this. What is secondary hemostatic plug? Fibrin plus platelet. What is primary hemostatic plug? Platelet and platelet. Right. Before I move to tell you about the coagulation pathway, just I wanted to let you know one important thing: how endothelium is anticoagulant. How endothelium is anticoagulant. Right. So how endothelium is anticoagulant? This I wanted to tell you. Right. How endothelium is anticoagulant? This I wanted to tell you. There are two important substances which examiner asks. I'm just asking. I'm just detailing with uh, those things which have been asked. Right. I'm not going to discuss each and everything. Right. So there are two important molecules which you have to understand. These are number one, heparin-like molecule. Previous year, AIMS question. Heparin-like molecule. And older India question also. It is not a very new kind of question. And second substance is the thrombomodulin. Thrombo. Modulin. So these are the these are the two anticoagulant substances which are present in the endothelium, right? So question in AIMS exam was what is the mechanism of the heparin-like molecule? What is the mechanism of the? Yes, very good. Chandra is telling it is by anti-thrombin three. So this heparin-like molecule is going to combine with anti-thrombin three. Right. So heparin is going to combine with anti-thrombin three, and this this mixture, this combination is going to inactivate which clot factor? That is the all-India question. They will they will inactivate which clot factor? Right. So very good. It will inactivate factor two and from factor nine to factor twelve. So all these factors will be inactivated by heparin-like molecule. That was the older all-India question, right? So heparin or heparin-like molecule. Remember the drug heparin. What you read or heparin-like molecule. What you are studying here, both will be having the same function. They will combine with anti-thrombin three and they will inactivate factor two, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All these things will be inactivated, by them, right? So this point is clear to everyone. Heparin-like molecule is going to combine with anti-thrombin three and they will inactivate this clotting factor and that is how they will prevent clotting or coagulation. Now come to the thrombomodulin. When you are seeing this thrombomodulin, see the name itself is there is some hint given in this name, thrombomodulin. So this name itself is telling that it will modulate the function of thrombin. This name says that it will change the function of thrombin. So what is thrombin? Anticoagulant or pro-coagulant? That is the other important MCQ. So thrombin is a pro-coagulant. It will promote coagulation. That is the meaning, right? Promote coagulation, right? But what will happen? See the name thrombomodulin. What they will do? The structure, the structural change to the anticoagulant form, right? So this anticoagulant C and protein factor. I think bracket eight five. Right? The question is: These are the another neat question. What is anti-thrombin three? What is protein C and protein S? Right. So what are these three things? Remember, anti-thrombin three, protein C, protein S. These are natural anticoagulants. So I am writing in green color so that we can correlate. These are the natural anticoagulant. Synthesized by liver. Synthesized by liver. That was the neat question. Natural anticoagulant synthesized by liver is anti-thrombin three, protein C, protein S, all of the above. That was the question, right? So now you can see how many questions have been asked from here. Very like molecule previous exam. What is their mechanism of action? That was the previous all-India question, right? Who are the natural anticoagulant? These are the all-India question, right? So you can see that is why I wanted to discuss this topic, and you can expect again some question from here, right? So this shows that. Endothelium consists of two components, heparin-like molecules and thrombomodulin, which will be behaving like an anticoagulant, and you have seen the mechanism, right? Now we will move to the next. As I was telling you, I will be teaching you about the coagulation pathway. How this coagulation pathway is going to help in clotting, right? Coagulation pathway, we all know that they are having two pathways, intrinsic and extrinsic, right? So these are the two important pathways. Coagulation pathway is having two pathways, intrinsic, extrinsic, right? Which is most common in vivo? Can you tell me? Within our human body, which is most common? Extrinsic or intrinsic? In comment box, can you tell me? Yes. Very good. Very good. Shantanu, Naveen, Vesli, Simran, all are correct. Manohar, Dina, right? So remember, this extrinsic pathway is most common in our human body, which is called as in vivo, right? Most common means this is most common, but this will also happen, but it is less common. Same way, intrinsic pathway is most common in test tube, in vitro. Vitro means test tube, vivo means our body, right? So in our body, most common is extrinsic. After some time, you will understand the concept also why it is most common in our human body, right? Right. So now we have to measure the defect. For measuring the intrinsic pathway, what we are going to use? See, extrinsic pathway, we are going to use the prothrombin time, which is 11 to 16 seconds, right? Intrinsic pathway, we are going to use APTT. Right, which is which is 30 to 40 seconds. Right, so these are the standard values which we have to remember. Right, so intrinsic pathway defect we will we will uh, look for we will look for with the help of ABTT extrinsic pathway with the prothrombin time. Right, so like that we are going to proceed. Right, now we will see <coughs> what extrinsic pathway how how this extrinsic pathway will be activated. Now I am going to tell you how this extrinsic pathway is getting activated. Whenever there is a tissue injury, <coughs> tissue injury will start releasing tissue thromboplastin. Tissue thromboplastin. Right, so tissue thromboplastin after the tissue injury, tissue thromboplastin will be released, and this tissue thromboplastin is going to activate factor seven. Now factor seven has been converted into activated form of factor seven, right? So that is the that is the important thing you have to remember. Tissue thromboplastin, yes, Amano has remembered correct. It is correct answer that you are telling that tissue thromboplastin will be activating extensive pathway, right? So what happens in extensive pathway? Tissue thromboplastin has been released. Now they are converting factor seven into activated form of the factor seven. This was the previous year AIMS question. Question was tissue thromboplastin is related to which pathway? So which pathway? Extensive pathway, right? So now you can see this is how simple question will be asked, right? Now <coughs> look at the look at the extensive pathway. What I have told you, extensive pathway is most common in human body. Why it is most common in human body? Because whenever our human body is getting injured, what they are going to release? So tissue is injured, so they are going to release tissue thromboplastin, right? So that is why extensive pathway is most common. You understand what I'm saying? Because we will be having tissue injury, and tissue is releasing tissue thromboplastin, and this is going to start the extensive pathway. That is why extensive pathway is most common in human body, right? Fine. So now this factor seven will enter into the another area from where it will be called as common pathway. So here we have to understand that from here onwards there will be starting of the common pathway. Why it is called as common pathway? Because common pathway means both intrinsic and extensive pathway are going to activate factor ten. Which is a common factor. Now, factor ten is activated by both of them. Right. So this point we have to remember, right? So why it is common pathway? Because common factor is activated by both intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. Right. Because common factor is activated by both intrinsic
right so when you talk about the <coughs> intrinsic pathway it is factor 12 which is activated which will activate 11 then 9 and then 8 and then they will come to the common pathway so this is how they will enter into the common pathway and they will activate factor 10 so now you can see factor 10 is the common for both the extrinsic and extrinsic pathway that is why it is the starting of the common pathway right now look at this factor 12 this factor 12 can tell me what is the another name of factor 12 Can tell me yes, very good. Shantanu is telling it is Hageman factor or contact factor. Yes, it is Hageman factor or contact factor, right? So remember these are the two important names of the clot factor twelve. So remember this clot factor twelve is also known as Hageman factor or contact factor, right? Fine. I am not worried about the Hageman factor. I am not not interested in that. But I am very much interested in the contact factor. Why it is called as contact factor? Because when they will come with the contact, see what is the what is the name says contact factor. When this clot will come with the contact of certain object or substances, they will be activated. So the question is which kind of substances? Very good. Shantanu, come see. Now uh, we see all are telling the correct answer. It will be activated by contact with which kind of factor? Which kind of factor? Can you tell me? It will be see this factor twelve is activated by negatively charged surface. Remember, it will be activated by negatively charged surface. So negatively charged surface is going to activate the factor twelve. That is why they are called as contact factor, right? Now what? That is why it is called as contact factor. So Hageman factor or factor twelve is also known as contact factor because they will be activated when they are coming in contact with negatively charged substances. And who are these negatively charged substances? Glass, silica, right, and kaolin. So these are the three important negatively charged substances which I wanted to write here, right? Why I wanted to write here? See, this question was previous year AIMS question, right? But this is the older AIMS question. Kaolin is required for activation in prothrombin time estimation. True or false? Can you write in the comment box? Kaolin for the prothrombin time. Yes. So now you can see. So that is how you can easily make it out. Glass, silica, kaolin. All these are for the all these are for the APTT, not for the PT. For PT activation, what they require? Tissue thromboplastin. That is the question in previous year, right? So now you got the point. Negatively charged glass, silica, kaolin. They will activate intrinsic pathway. So they are required for activation of APTT, not for PT. PT is an extrinsic pathway, and extrinsic pathway is activated by the tissue thromboplastin, which is coming from our own tissue, right? So that is very, very important point to understand, right? That is very, very important point to understand. This glass silica and kaolin will be activating intrinsic pathway. Now you can see why I said this is the most common in vitro because you can see all these things are outside the body, and that is why it will be most commonly, most commonly. See what I am saying? Most commonly associated with the, this one, right? Now we will see the next page. I will be reading what this factor ten is going to do. What this factor ten is going to do? Factor ten is going to activate prothrombin, prothrombin to thrombin, right? So prothrombin to thrombin is converted by factor ten, right? So there was a question in PGI exam. There was a question in PGI exam. Factor ten means sorry, prothrombin is activated to form prothrombin by by which clot factor? Factor ten, factor five, or factor four? So it's a PGI question. So can you tell me what should be the right answer? Five, four, ten, all of the above. Yes, so all will be there, right? So very good, uh, Shantya, you are correct. Manoj is also telling the same answer. Like Manoj is also telling the same answer. So very good, you are knowing about this. So remember here, who is going to activate? See, number one is the factor ten. Number two is the factor five, and number three is the factor four. Remember, uh, calcium is also called as factor four in PGI exam. They use word calcium. Right? Calcium is also known as factor four. So prothrombin, prothrombin, prothrombin conversion requires three factors. Ten. Five and four, so you can remember like this: four, five, ten, four, five, and double of five, ten. So four, five, ten, four is calcium. Remember like this also: four is calcium, right? So now thrombin has been formed. So what thrombin is going to do? Thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, right? So thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, right? Unstable liquid monomer. This fibrin, fibrin, it is factor thirteen, right? So factor thirteen is that is why factor thirteen is also known as fibrin stabilizing factor. Fibrin stabilizing factor, right? So that is why factor thirteen is also known as fibrin stabilizing factor. So this is how fibrin stabilizing factor will be stabilizing them. So how they are going to stabilize them? Now this fibrin will be fibrin will be converted into clot. Fibrin has been converted into clot because this fibrin has been polymerized, right? Here it was monomer. Now it has been polymerized. Now they are stable and in solid form. Stable and in solid form. So that is how you can see fibrin clot is formed, right? So now you can see polymerization and solidification will be stabilizing this fibrin, and now they are clot. This is the PGI question. Clot lysis is a part of coagulation pathway. True or false? Can you write in the comment? Yes, very good. So that is how question will be asked. So remember, this fibrin clot. This is not the end of the clotting pathway. Remember, many students they feel that fibrin clot has been formed, so clotting pathway is completed. No, it's not like that. This fibrin clot has to be lysed, right? It has to be lysed, right? So this is called clot lysis. This is called clot lysis, and this clot lysis is done by which protein? That is called plasmin. Another neat PG question. Which protein from the liver? So remember, plasmin is synthesized from the liver, and they are going to degrade the fibrin into fibrin degradation products, right? So fibrin degradation products, which we call FDP, right? So now you can see this is the end product of the clotting pathway, right? So now the clotting pathway is completed. So now you understood. This is the clotting pathway, coagulation pathway, which was activated inside the platelet, right? Which was activated by the uh, granules present inside the platelet. I should say like this. It is activated by granules. So you can see factor uh, calcium is there, factor five is there, factor eight is there. So all these things will together and they will activate the coagulation pathway, and this is how fibrin will be formed, which was forming the plug that time. Right, so this plug will be clotting this, uh, clotting that site, and after after the clotting is completed, after the wound has been healed, this clot will be lysed by the plasmin into these smaller fragments, which is called as fibrin degradation product. Right, so is it clear to everyone? Can I see your thumbs up? If it is clear to all of you, and the next step is the what are the routine protocols we should follow in a blood, in a coagulation lab? Right, so what is the routine? First thing, see the first question is when you are receiving a blood sample. See, we are talking about the coagulation lab now. We are not talking about the ordinary lab. Coagulation lab means where you are going to deal with the bleeding and coagulation disorder. Right, so patient has come. Right, you are going to collect the blood sample. What syringes and vials you are going to use? Plastic syringes or glass syringes and vials? So now, first thing, see the first question is when you are receiving a blood sample. See, we are talking about the coagulation lab. Now we are not talking about the ordinary lab. Coagulation lab means where you are going to deal with the bleeding and coagulation disorder, right? So patient has come, right? You are going to collect the blood sample. What syringes and vials you are going to use? Plastic syringes or glass syringes and vials? Can you tell me the comment? Yes, very good. So you are going to use plastic syringes and vials. So number one rule for coagulation lab: plastic syringes and vials should be used. Why not glass? Why not glass? Right. So many of you might be thinking, why not glasses? We are going to use. So now you can see why we are not using glasses because glasses will activate intrinsic pathway, and you will find that intrinsic pathway is going to be normal. 
right? So now even yes, very good. Uh, Anurag, if it activates the intrinsic pathway, and suppose this application of the hemophilia where factor eight should be deficient, so it will be looking normal, right? So that is why glass, silica, kaolin, all these things are never used for the never used for the collection of this. Find that intrinsic pathway is appearing to be normal, right? Why not glass? Is are never used because it will activate intrinsic pathway, right? So what we should use plastic syringes and wires should be used, right? Now come to the second thing. Second thing is uh, now you have collected a sample, right? So where you will keep the sample? Where you will keep the sample? Very good, Sandro. You should keep them at 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. Remember, which is called room temperature. So whenever you are dealing with the coagulation uh, lab analysis for the blood, you should keep that sample at room temperature, which is 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, right? After keeping it at a room temperature, what you should do now means when you should process the sample. That is the other important thing. Another thing, sorry, one more thing which I was I wanted to tell you. What kind of sample you will use here? Means what kind of sample you are going to process? Means uh, platelet rich plasma or platelet poor plasma? Can you tell me in the comment? Platelet poor plasma. Very good, Naveen, uh, Ramakrishna. Very nice. Everybody is saying the right answer only. I'm very happy with that thing. Right. So it is platelet poor plasma. So it is platelet poor plasma. So because it's a coagulation study, we are we are we are targeting about the we are targeting about the uh, clot factor, and we all know that. Right. And always remember, platelet rich plasma is used for platelet disorders. So that can be another future question which examiner may ask. Right. So platelet-rich plasma is used for platelet disorder, right? Right. So now uh, we are seeing that uh, we have used plastic syringes. Temperature we are keeping for the 20 to 25 degrees Celsius for storage, and sample should be platelet poor plasma. Sample must be processed within how many hours or minutes? So processing should be completed within how many minutes? This was the AIMS question also, right? Very good. So sample must be processed within two hours. That was the answer in AIMS exam, right? So within two hours you should process the sample because after two hours. Clot factor will start decaying. They will start degrading. So there will be no use, or you will be getting the false values, right? So that is why whenever you receive a sample for coagulation analysis, it will start decaying. They will start different points about the routine, right? Next is what is the best anticoagulant? That is the another important MCQ which examiner had asked. Best anticoagulant for coagulation studies. So best anticoagulant for coagulation study is trisodium citrate. No, it's not heparin, trisodium citrate. So modify that. And remember, this was the question in AIMS and All India both exam. Trisodium citrate is used for trisodium citrate is used for the anticoagulant. Right. So best anticoagulant for coagulation study is the trisodium citrate. Right. Some students have written heparin, so that is also important thing to understand. Heparin is best. This was AIMS question in 2018. Heparin is best for what? Arterial blood gas analysis. Arterial blood gas analysis. A B G. Right, arterial blood gas analysis. Right, there was a question in AIMS exam. Serum electrolytes are measured by which of the following preservative or which of the following question in 2018? Heparin is best for what? Arterial blood gas analysis. Arterial blood gas analysis. A, B, G. Right, arterial blood gas analysis. Right, there was a question in AIMS exam. Serum electrolytes are measured by which of the following preservative or which of the following preservative should be used? Usually, I will tell you. For serum electrolyte, we use plain bulb without any electrolyte, right? Without any preservative. But sometime when you have to transport it, what should be the best one? Then you have to remember, heparin should be used for serum electrolyte also, right? So serum electrolytes also we have to use heparin, right? So ABG, if you if you have observed ABG in your world, you would have seen the reading, right? So there there will be reading of the PO2, PCO2, and there will be sodium also. There will be potassium also. There will be calcium also. So what are these things? These are the all electrolyte. So you can remember like this also. Heparin is best for ABG, and ABG we are using serum electrolyte also. So that is very obvious common sense based question. That is why AIMS people they ask such kind of question. Remember, AIMS is not a havoc. It's not a very big exam. Don't have this kind of psychology which I used to have in my time. Nobody has explained me. After writing AIMS, I came to know that these are easy questions only, right? But before going to the AIMS exam, I used to be worried. Oh, this will be a very big question. High five question will be asked. So you will be under tremendous pressure and stress. And in that pressure and stress, you will be committing so many silly mistakes, which will eliminate you. So remember this point: AIMS exam or any exam is just like an another exam. Don't think that this is a very big exam. Nothing. It's a just an exam. My concepts are good. I will perform good. This kind of thought process should be going in your mind. Remember, this is very very essential. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to crack AIMS exam. And I have seen many AIMSonian or many students who have cracked the AIMS. They are just average student, but their belief was very strong. Yes, I can do it. So remember that belief should be in your mind, right? So that is how they will be asking common sense. So open your mind. Be 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 frank about it. Don't worry about anything. Even if you are into the aims, you will be just having a tagline of aims. That's all. After that, be right there from other institutes also, right? So this is what I wanted to tell you that be open in your exam. Don't worry about the question. Think about the concept. Don't think about the exam. According to the concept, whatever is looking right, go for that. Don't think it's going to use EDT. Remember, for CBC, best right answer, right? So now we can see serum electrolyte. There are uh, for CBC what we are going to use. When we are going to analyze CBC, we are going to use EDT. Remember, for CBC, best will be EDT. So these are the uh, some important points which you have to keep in mind for future exam, right? Which exam will be asked, right? So now coming to the uh, this point, we have uh, deal now. Uh, I'm going to tell you the next thing. See, we have, we have seen why coagulation pathway is important, how this will form the fibrin, how bleeding will start and bleeding will stop, right? And when we are going for any coagulation history, what are the bleeding protocols we have to follow, right? Now I'm going to tell you what, what should be our approach towards the bleeding disorder. When a bleeding disorder patient is coming to us, bleeding disorder patient is coming to us, what should be our approach? Not only for the MCQ exam point of view, it is for both 
MCQ plus practical view also. So whenever uh, a bleeding patient is coming to us, you have to observe for two things. Whether they are having minor bleeding or major bleeding. Minor bleeding or major bleeding. How you will see minor bleeding? How you will observe minor bleeding clinically? Anybody in the comment box? Minor bleeding will be seen as a yes, very good, petechia and purpura. So minor bleeding is in the form of petechia and purpura. Where you will see petechia and purpura? Where you will see all these petechia and purpura? Skin or mucosa, right? So skin or mucosal aspect you will be seeing, right? So skin and mucosal aspect, very good, shaita, sandhanu, all are, right? Skin and mucosa you will be seeing this minor bleeding, right? Petechia and purpura will be seen on that area, right? So whenever you are seeing a petechia purpura on skin or mucosa, so what will be your uh, what will be your doubt or your suspicion for this patient? This patient is having a clot factor deficiency or this patient is having platelet deficiency? Yes, very good. So whenever you find this kind of presentation, you will suspect platelet disorder. You will suspect platelet disorder, right? So now we are suspecting platelet disorder. Fine. So after suspecting platelet disorder, what is the next investigation? What is the next investigation we are going to do when we are suspecting any platelet disorder? So remember, this is the question in the exam. Next should be the platelet count. Right? So next investigation should be platelet count. And how much is the normal platelet count? 1.5 to 4.5 lakhs per mmq. This is the normal platelet count. 1.5 to 4.5. This is 4.5. 4.5. Right? So platelet count is 1.5 to 4.5 lakhs per mmq. So this is the platelet count. And the next thing what you are going to do, that is the bleeding time. What is normal bleeding time? 2 to 9 minutes. Right, so two to nine minutes. So bleeding time is two to nine minutes. Now, now you can see a, a very good clinical scenario here. Right, I'm just giving you one example. A patient has come, and uh, blood was collected by the clinician from the medicine ward, sent to the pathology lab where the technician was there doing the test. And when our clinician has written the um, history, he has written thrombocytopenia. Right, but technician is saying that the platelet count is normal. See what technician is telling, sir, platelet count is normal. How come you can say that it is a thrombocytopenia? Because why? Why clinician has said thrombocytopenia? Because he would have observed platelet purpura on the mucosal aspect or on the skin. That is why he has written uh, thrombocytopenia. But when it was run in the automated machine, platelet count was normal. And this technician is asking you, sir, what to do now? You are, I think you are giving me the wrong samples. What you should do? What you should suggest at this point? Right. So this is the clinical scenario which examiner can ask in AIMS exam also. Right. So what you will order the next investigation? That is why I said first investigation is the platelet count. Next investigation should be bleeding time. Why bleeding time? Because bleeding time is measuring what? That is the neat question. Bleeding time is for the measurement of platelet. Function. Remember, platelet function is measured by bleeding time. That was the neat question, right? Platelet function. Yes, very good. Sir, yes, Andrew. Platelet function is measured by the bleeding time, right? So sometimes what will happen? Bleeding time will be normal, but platelet function will be abnormal, and these are the platelet functional defect disorder, like Ganz-Manns or the Nosolia, right? So that is why we should know all these things in our practical life also, because you will be facing this kind of problem. Patient will be uh, clinically will be appearing like a thrombocytopenia because of the platelet purpura, and when you are seeing the platelet count is normal, so that time you should suggest go for the bleeding time, because bleeding time may be prolonged, and when bleeding time is prolonged, that will be suggestive of that will be suggestive of the platelet functional defect disorder, right? So now you understood. Whenever minor bleeding is there, we should think about the platelet disorder, right? Now come to the major bleeding. Major hemorrhage, how it will be presenting? Major hemorrhage will be presenting with the hematrosis, bleeding into the joint. Hematrosis means bleeding into the joint. Bleeding into joints. Right? So patient will be having red joint and he will be having recurrent joint pain. Reddish color of the joint and recurrent joint pain. This will be the characteristic history you will be getting from the patient also and in exam also. Right? So whenever you are seeing hematrosis bleeding into the joint, you are suspecting which bleeding into joints. Right? So patient will be having red joint and he will be having recurrent joint pain. Reddish color of the joint and recurrent joint pain. This will be the characteristic history you will be getting from the patient also and in exam also. Right? So whenever you are seeing hematrosis bleeding into the joint, you are suspecting which disorder? Clot factor deficiency disorder. Right? So now we are suspecting clot factor deficiency disorder. So what investigation we are going to perform? PT or APTT. Right? So this is how your approach should be. So this is what I wanted to say that whenever, uh, whenever yes, uh, Saita and Santhani you are telling it can be seen in spontaneous hematoma also. Right? So I have given this is the most common one. But remember sometimes whenever you are playing some game and there is a development of spontaneous hematoma, where? Into the larger muscles. Into the larger muscles like thighs. That is also one history for the major hemorrhage, right? So remember this point. That is also a history we should consider as a for major hemorrhage, right? Spontaneous hematoma. He will be giving history. Sir, so I playing football. I stretched my leg abnormally, and suddenly there was a problem with me. And after two days, I am seeing this is reddishness or bluish color. So this is again a hint for the. This is again a hint for the major hemorrhage, right? So now we are seeing hematosis or spontaneous hematoma. We have to go for the clot factor detection. That is PTN right? So this is the clinical approach. Whenever we are seeing a bleeding patient, you have to think about bleeding is minor or major, and then decide the approach, right? So by understanding this, now you can see what what should be the MCQ which examiner will be asking in your exam, right? Examiner will be asking question in ITP which is not seen, petechi purpura or hematosis, right? So here. ITP is uh, immunogenic thrombocytopenia, right? Thrombocytopenia is platelet disorder. So platelet disorder, what you will see, platelet you will find, right? So you will not find hematrosis. Same way. So now you look at this. Examiner is asking in hemophilia A, seen. You have to think about bleeding is minor or major, and then decide the approach. Seen hematrosis or platelet purpura, right? So here ITP is uh, immunogenic thrombocytopenia, right? Thrombocytopenia is platelet disorder. So platelet disorder, what you will see, platelet purpura, you will find, right? So you will not find hematrosis. Same way. So now you look at this. Examiner is asking in hemophilia A, which of the following is not seen? Hematrosis or platelet purpura. Right, so now you can see particular purpura will not be seen in hemophilia A because it's a clot factor disorder, right? So that is why I said this is how it will go, it will help you in your exam, right? And in exam also it will help you in clinical life also it will help you, right? Now we will discuss about the clot factor disorders, right? Simply I will just tell you about the clot factor disorders like a hemophilia. So I'm just writing hemophilia A. This is the hemophilia B, and this one is the hemophilia C. So these are the three types of hemophilias, right? These are the three types of hemophilias we are seeing, right? One of the very important and frequently asked questions in NEET PG exam. Hemophilia A is due to deficiency of clot factor eight. B is deficiency of clot factor. 9 and C is deficiency of clot factor 11. Right? So, very good. So, you all are telling right answer. Yes, Naveen, Chantanu, Sinduja, Navesi, all are telling right answer. Right? So, 8, 9, 11, A, B, C. Right? So, these are the three types of hemophilia. Remember, out of these three types of hemophilias, hemophilia A and B both are X linked recessive. So, it will be affecting more commonly who will be affected? Males are more commonly affected than females. Right? Whereas, hemophilia C is an autosomal recessive disorder. In genetics, also, I have got this. Right? Hemophilia C is autosomal recessive. Hemophilia A and B is X linked
hematosis but here most common presentation will be asymptomatic that was the dmb question in 2016 hemophilia c most common presentation will be asymptomatic very good navin shantanu saita <coughs> all, all are doing the right thing only right so hemophilia c will be asymptomatic right so this point you have to remember hemophilia c will just casually come to your opd or in your lab and you will take this check my blood i don't have any problem i am asymptomatic but suddenly you will be seeing that oh my god you are having level deficiency and then you will also say oh my god level is deficient so this is the presentation asymptomatic even he will not know about himself right or she will not know about herself so this is how you have to understand right now uh, why I, i wanted to tell like this after that when you will see the lab test lab test will be common for all of them because if you look at all these factors so they all belongs to 8 9 11 they all belongs to intrinsic pathway right so in the lab investigation what you will see that they will have aptt prolongation right pt will be normal because prothrombin and extrinsic pathway is not affected so aptt is increased pta is normal and what about the platelet count can you tell me what will be the platelet count and what will be the bleeding time in this patient very good very good navin uh, shahita navashri bindu very good it's very good response sindhuja manoparameter will be increased so aptt will be increased because you know that intrinsic pathway is affected right so that is how we will understand so now a patient is now look at the clinical scenario look at the clinical scenario patient has come to you right he is having hemophilia right he he, he is telling sir uh, in if when i have been investigated i found that apt was prolonged doctor told me that you are having hemophilia why going through the google that is the most common thing right now right people they do on google searching i found that it can be hemophilia a b c i don't know which hemophilia i am suffering from please tell me very good very nice santanu so in that scenario remember to discriminate examiner can ask question like this to discriminate hemophilia as like a b and c what should be investigation of choice so in that scenario you have to remember investigation of choice will be factor sa analysis factor sa is nothing but it is a quantitative test it is a quantitative analysis of the clot factor right so it's a quantity we are using that's all so in factor sa we are checking the quantity of factor a 9 11 right it is deficient so hemophilia a 9 is deficient so it is hemophilia b 11 is deficient so it will be hemophilia c so like that you will decide that these are the these are the types of hemophilia right so now you you have a clear idea whenever hemophilia patient is coming with prolongation of the apt how we have to discriminate them by using the which investigation that investigation is called as factor sa and it can be a future question in your exam right so factor sa will be helping them to uh, discriminate various types of hemophilia right now come to the uh, next important disorder is dic right dic is disseminated intravascular coagulation right disseminated intravascular coagulation also called as consumptive coagulopathy also called as consumptive coagulopathy right so this is also known as consumptive coagulopathy right why it is called as yes or it is also called as consumptive coagulopathy why it is called as consumptive coagulopathy because it will be consuming all the platelets right it will be consuming all the platelets or clot factor means consuming means damaging so all will be damaged platelet clot factor everything will be damaged by this dic right so that is why it is called as consumptive coagulopathy this dic right so that is why it is called as consumptive coagulopathy right and uh, if you ask me what is the most common cause of dic i will be saying that it is obstetric related reasons are the most common cause of the dic right when you are seeing clinically how you will identify dic patient they will be having bleeding from the venipuncture side this is one of the very important thing which you will see in the ward bleeding from venipuncture side from where you are doing the venipuncture there will be bleeding will be going on so bleeding from the venipuncture side is one of the very common thing you will be seeing in this patient right so when you are seeing this kind of yes abrupt shock placenta right so you will be seeing this kind of presentation so whenever you are seeing this kind of presentation and you will plan for investigation right so i am saying that in dic investigation can you tell me what should be the platelet count can you tell me the point abrupt shock placenta right so you will be seeing this kind of presentation so whenever you are seeing this kind of presentation and you will plan for investigation right so i am saying that in dic investigation can you tell me what should be the platelet count can you tell me the point platelet count should be decreased yes very good platelet count will be decreased bleeding time will be prolonged right so did you get that lab investigation of the dic so what we are seeing now lab investigation of dic very important mcq already exam many times they are asked and previous year aims exam there was a question right so in dic platelet count is decreased bleeding time is prolonged and all clot factor is decreased so that is why what will happen both pt and apt will be prolonged Right. Remember what I have said. Coagulation pathway. Uh, uh, sorry, all clot factor will be consumed, or it will be damaged in DIC. That is why the intrinsic extrinsic both pathway will be affected, and both will be elevated. So that is why we are seeing prolongation of both PT and APT. Right. So clear about that. Now you tell me, what will happen to the fibrinogen? That is the another important MCQ which is generally asked. Very good. See this. Always remember what is the DIC in simple words. Hyper activation of coagulation pathway. In simple word, hyperactivation of the coagulation coagulation pathway in forward direction. Forward direction. So by this you can understand. See what I'm saying that if if you have to understand by one one simple uh, easy concept, DIC is the hyperactivation of the coagulation pathway in the forward direction. So if it is in forward direction, so what will happen? End product will be always raised. Fibrin degradation product is the end product which will be always high. Right? Do you understand? All the intermediate will be decreased. Remember, all the intermediate will be decreased, but the end product will be always elevated. So that is why FDP is elevated, but serum fibrin will be decreased. Please more. Now come to the question which I've been asking AIMS and uh, already exam. What is the most sensitive test? what is the most specific test and what is the best test for hematology lab remember we are talking about the hematology lab i am not going to the medicine lab because i i don't know about the medicine and on the radiology right forward means end product accumulation yes paul it means end product accumulation because it is going in the forward direction right so it means the end product will be more and substrate will be less right in terms of the enzyme if you are thinking right. so the most uh, sensitive test what will be the most sensitive test try to understand this will be always formed in all kind of coagulation pathway whether it is the dic whether it is a normal so it is most sensitive you understand so it is most sensitive because it will be seen in all kind of scenarios so most sensitive test will be increase in fibrin fibrin degradation product right now i will tell you what happens in dic in dic fibrin degradation product comes into the serum they will be divided into the two segment d isomer and e isomer right e isomer will be inactivated in the serum very soon and d isomer will be persisting which we are going to measure as a d dimer right and d dimer is the most specific and best investigation in hematology lab previous year previous year aims exam they asked what is the most sensitive test for the dic patient that was the ftp so that is why i wanted to discuss this uh, dic topic where you will see both platelet and clot factors have been destroyed right so i think it's clear to all of you now we will move to the next topic right so we have seen about the clot factor discussion now we are going to discuss about the uh, platelet disorders right When we are talking about the platelet disorders, we can uh, divide platelet disorders into two broader categories. Right, one is qualitative, 
means quality is altered. Qualitative means quality is altered means function is altered, right? So one is qualitative functional and second is quantitative, where quantity is decreased, right? So quantitative and qualitative, these are the two things we have to remember, right? So what happens in uh, quanti qualitative, I will tell you what happens in qualitative when you will see the lab test. In qualitative, what will be the lab finding? You will see platelet count will be normal. Platelet count is normal, as I have told you, but the function will be defective, that is why bleeding time is prolonged. And such disorders are called as platelet functional defect disorders. Platelet functional defect disorder. Right, so these are platelet functional defect disorders. Right, I will write the example on the next page because here there is no space. Right, understand? It's a quality which has been altered, not the quantity. See, count is normal. Quality has been altered, function has been altered. That is why bleeding time is prolonged. Right, that is why the name is functional defect of the platelet. Right, but when we talk about the uh, platelet quantitative disorder, platelet count will be decreased, count will be decreased, and bleeding time will be prolonged. Right, so now you can see there is a different lab investigation. So this question has already a question also. Platelet functional defect disorder. What is the presentation in the lab? Right, the so count will be normal, bleeding time will be prolonged. Right, so that that's we understood. Now next page, I'm going to tell you who are the platelet functional defect disorders. Right, so platelet functional defect disorders are Bernard Solier disease. Bernard Solier disease, number one. So here onwards I will be writing in short BSD. Second is Glangman's thrombosthenia. Glangman thrombosthenia. Thrombosthenia. Here onwards I will be writing in short GT. Glangman's thrombosthenia. And third I will write in short form that is von Willebrand disease. Remember von Willebrand disease is a mixed kind of disorder where you will see the platelet problem also, where you will find the uh, defect in the clot factor also. Right? So that both can be present, but if the examiner asks you, this was PGI question. This was PGI question. Who are the platelet functional defect disorder? Who are the platelet functional defect disorder? So that time all three statements was given and all three are platelet functional disorder. Like that you have to see. But von Willebrand factor, von Willebrand disease is also considered as clot factor disorder because because von Willebrand factor stabilizes. It stabilizes factor 8, right? And because of decrease in one Willebrand factor, factor 8 will be also decreased in one Willebrand disease. So that is the reason why we say that one Willebrand disease is a heterogeneous disorder. Heterogeneous. Because platelet, not factor, both will be. That is the platelet functional defect disorder. Now come to the uh, quantitative uh, disorder. Now I'm going to tell you about the quantitative. If you remember quantitative, how we are going to divide. Quantitative, we are going to divide like this. Quantitative, we can divide uh, like this. Uh, it's a mega karyocytic thrombocytopenia. Or a mega karyocytic thrombocytopenia, right? So quantitative will be calling as a thrombocytopenia, right? Thrombocytopenia. So this thrombocytopenia can be mega karyocytic or a mega karyocytic. So that is also one important MCQ which was asked in AIMS exam. It's older AIMS question and remember it can come again, right? So a mega karyocytic and mega karyocytic. Very good, uh, Saita. I mean, you are all going in the right direction only, right? Why it is called as mega karyocytic direction? My mega karyocytic thrombocytopenia. In this, what is happening? Platelet uh, in peripheral blood. Platelet is destroyed, right? So destruction of platelet is there in peripheral blood, right? So what is happening? If peripheral blood, see, if peripheral blood there is a destruction of the platelet, who is going to compensate? Can you tell me? If peripheral blood, blood damage, uh, uh, platelet damage is going on, who is going to compensate? Bunar, very good site, Santanu, Naveen, Sinduja, all are telling, right? So that is the answer. Whenever there is a damage of the platelet in the peripheral blood, who is going to compensate? Bunar is going to compensate. And how, how they are going to compensate? By forming the increased amount of mega karyocyte. Peripheral blood destruction is compensated by increased mega karyocyte production by the bone marrow. So can you tell me this bone marrow is normal or abnormal? Very good. Naveen is telling it's normal. So that is a great answer. Bone marrow is normal. That is why they can compensate. Normal only can compensate. Abnormal thing will never compensate. Right? So that is why it is called as mega karyocyte. Remember, why it is called as mega karyocyte thrombocytopenia? Because here peripheral blood is abnormal, bone marrow is normal. Did you see? Peripheral blood is abnormal, that is why destruction is going on. But bone marrow is normal and that is why they are producing more number of the mega karyocyte. So that is how they are protecting us. Now come to the <coughs> A mega karyocyte. A mega karyocyte, you can see the name itself is telling bone marrow is defective. Bone marrow is defective. And because of defect, there is no mega karyocyte production. And because of lack of mega karyocytic production in peripheral blood, also you will see there is no platelet or decreased platelet. Right? So now you can see bone marrow and peripheral blood. What is happening here? Here, bone marrow is abnormal, defective. And peripheral blood is normal. Or, or peripheral blood is also abnormal, we should say. Peripheral blood is abnormal because bone marrow is abnormal. That is why it is called as a mega karyocytic thrombocytopenia. Where? What is the example? Can you tell me? Dani, very good, very good, Shantanu. I was asking the same question. Which anemia you will be having this kind of presentation? Remember, this was the AIMS question. Whenever bone marrow is damaged, Whenever bone marrow is damaged, or whenever you are seeing aplastic anemia, in this kind of patient, you will be seeing a mega karyocytic thrombocytopenia because bone marrow is damaged. Right? Because bone marrow is damaged in the aplastic anemia. So this will be the case of the a mega karyocytic thrombocytopenia. Coming to the mega karyocytic thrombocytopenia, again we can divide as Naveen has told, it can be immunogenic and non-immunogenic. Right? So immunogenic and non-immunogenic. So immunogenic example is the IDP, immunogenic thrombocytopenic purpura, and non-immunogenic example will be non-immunogenic example will be the hemolytic uremic syndrome, and second example will be thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, TTP, which is called as thrombotic. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, right? So I'm just writing in the short. Right, so now you can see this is the overall view of the platelet disorder classification, right? Uh, quantitative, qualitative. Qualitative, we are seeing now quantitative, we are dividing mega karyocytic, a mega karyocytic. Now mega karyocytic is again we are dividing the into uh, two parts, ITP, uh, sorry, immunogenic and non-immunogenic. ITP is immunogenic and non-immunogenic is hemolytic uremic syndrome and TTP, right? So now it's clear. Now we will uh, move to the next one. Next one I'm going to discuss here is the platelet functional defect disorder, right? So in platelet functional defect disorder, you need a lot of concepts. Now I'm going to uh, explain you some concepts which will help you in your exam. And there are so many questions I've been asked from here itself. Once you understood that concept, the remaining part of the platelet disorder will become very easy for you, right? So what is that concept which I wanted to let you know that this is the blood vessel. This is the blood vessel wall, right? Blood vessel wall lined by endothelium. So these are the endothelial lining, right? So these are the endothelial lining, endothelial lining, right? Endothelial lining is containing a substance, a granule inside them, which is called as bebel pellet bodies, right? So this granule is called as bebel pellet. Bebel pellet body. So this question had been asked in exam also. Bebel pellet bodies are present in endothelium. Right? Simple question. Bebel pellet bodies are present in endothelium. And what is their function? Their function is to synthesize and store von Willebrand factor. Synthesis and storage 
of one delay brand factor right so examiner asked this question so these are these are flurry offensive use which examiner asked in exam and this was the recent india question also one delay brand factors are present in the bebel pellet bodies right one delay brand factors are present in the bebel pellet bodies right bebel pellet bodies and bebel pellet bodies are inside the endothelium right so what is the function of this uh, one delay brand factor right so now we can see that see this is the one delay brand factor and now you you will observe these two platelets platelets have two important uh, uh, receptor on their surface one is called gp1b glycoprotein 1b and second is called as gp2b3a gp 2 b 3 a So these are the two receptors. Now you can see these are the two receptors on the surface of the platelet, right? On the surface of the platelet. Now the, the question is, this was the aim's question. GP1B will combine with which of the following? Right? So GP1B will be combining with one billion brand factor, right? So now you can see that GP1B will combine with one billion brand factor during the activation of the platelet, right? So GP1B will combine with one billion brand factor. See what I'm saying? GP1B on the platelet. One billion factor on the endothelium, on the pelvis surface, right? So what is this called as? This is called as platelet addition. Remember, this is called as platelet addition, and that was the question in AIMS exam. Addition is mediated by which receptor? Remember, addition is mediated by GP1B at one billion brand factor, right? Addition means platelet is getting attached to the blood vessel wall. Right, so this is the meaning of addition. Platelet is getting attached to the blood vessel wall is called as addition, and this will be mediated by which two receptor? GP one B on the platelet, one blood brand factor on the endothelial surface. Right, so it's clear to everyone. So this is called addition. Come to the aggregation. Aggregation will be mediated by another important compound here that is called fibrinogen. Suppose this is called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen will connect to GP two B three A. Right, so now this platelet and platelet are attached to the GP two B three A receptor, and this is called as platelet aggregation. Right, platelet aggregation means when platelet is getting attached to the another platelet, this is called as aggregation. So this point should be very clear. Remember, what is addition? Whenever somebody is adding platelet, is getting adherence. So you have to immediately think about it. This is going to attach to the vessel. Now you can understand rest of the things also. Right? This was the older PGI question. What is fibrinogen? Fibrinogen is a platelet aggregator. Platelet aggregator. That was the question in PGI exam. Right? So fibrinogen, now you can see. And there was a question in PGI exam. What is the receptor for fibrinogen on the platelet? So answer is GP two B three A. Fibrinogen is going to attach to GP two B three A. Right? Now we will see what are the investigation we are going to use for platelet functional defect disorder. So there are two important things for aggregation. Remember for platelet aggregation. Platelet aggregation. We are going to use a test which is called as platelet aggregation test with ADP, collagen, and epinephrine. Remember, this is how we will remember platelet aggregation test. We are going to use ADP, collagen, epinephrine. Right? ADP, A for ADP, C for collagen, and E for epinephrine. This, these are all PGI statement. That is why I wrote. And you can remember by the pharma drug ACE inhibitors, right? So this is the morning. What I want to say that all these substances are the famous aggregators. Remember, what are these substances? These substances are the famous platelet aggregator. That was the PGI question. Which of the following is platelet aggregator? A, ADP, collagen, epinephrine, fibrinogen. So now you can see all four are platelet aggregators. So that was the question in PGI exam, right? That was the yes or no. These are all platelet aggregator. So uh, uh, this now we will do the simple lab test for the aggregation analysis. What we are doing? Aggregation analysis, right? So platelet aggregation test. So what are the interpretation we'll be having? Either it will be a normal. Or it will be abnormal. That's all. There is no complication here. So what we are going to do? Platelet aggregation. We are doing going to perform with the help of ADP, collagen, and epinephrine. Either it will be normal or abnormal. That's all. Second thing we are going to check for the platelet addition, and this is a little complicated one. Platelet addition. See, this uh, test is called as Ristocetin assay. Ristocetin assay. But for point of understanding, I am going to call this as a Ristocetin addition test, right? So that you can understand Ristocetin addition test. I am going to use word addition, right? But in the standard textbooks, when you read Williams, Winthrop, you will be finding Ristocetin assay word, right? Because it will avoid the confusion. Right. So what happens? What is Ristocetin? Ristocetin. What is the concept of which I wanted to let you know that this Ristocetin is a drug. This is a drug which has been banned. Why it has been banned? Because when it will go into the blood, this will induce GP1B and one billion factor. So what is this called as addition? That is why the name is Ristocetin addition test. That is why I am using the word right. So why Ristocetin drug has been now uh, banned? Because it will induce the two important things, GP1B and one billion factor on the surface. Right. So when they are induced on the uh, surface of the uh, platelet, what they are going to do? They are going to do the addition, abnormal addition. Right. So now you can see when both are present, when both are present, it will be considered as normal. Right. When both are present, obviously when both are present, it will be normal. So this is very important to understand. Whenever we are doing Ristocetin addition test, and suppose examiner is saying Ristocetin addition test is positive. Right. So whenever examiner is saying Ristocetin addition test or Ristocetin test is positive, so this picture should revolve in your mind. Positive means this is also positive. This is also positive. Means present. Right. And if it is present, means it is normal or abnormal. Normal. Right. It will be normal. Now look at the other scenario. If examiner says that Ristocetin addition test is negative. So what is this meaning? Negative means either GP1B is absent or one billion factor is absent. That is the meaning of negative. So negative means abnormal. So that is how you have to understand the interpretation of the addition of the platelet. Right. So this is a little complicated one, right? Because usually we say that positive, as I said, positive is abnormal. Red is positive is abnormal. But here, Ristocetin addition test positive means it is a, it is a normal. So that is what I said. Whenever examiner says Ristocetin addition test is positive, so immediately what, what your mind should frame? Okay, positive means GP1B, one billion factor, both are present. It means it's normal. And if it is negative, means something is negative. Negative means abnormal. Something is negative, means something is absent. So it is abnormal, right? So now you understood the platelet aggregation test and platelet, sorry, and platelet uh, addition test like Ristocetin addition test, right? Now you will understand why I explained like this, so that we. Can understand about the Bernard Solier disease. Number one. So platelet functional defect disorder, which I'm going to discuss here, is the Bernard Solier disease. So what will happen in Bernard Solier disease? Remember, this is an autosomal recessive disorder, and glycoprotein 1B is defective here. GP2B3A is normal. GP2B3A is normal. So it is GP1B which is defective. So what is this disorder? Platelet addition disorder or aggregation disorder? Can you tell me? Yes, very good. Yes, Manohar, Santanu, Navin, very good. So whenever this GP1B is defective, it means it is a platelet addition disorder, right? So it is platelet addition disorder. So what is Bernard Solier disease? It is a platelet addition disorder, right? In this platelet addition disorder, when you will see the lab finding, one by one, I will ask you, what will happen to the Bleeding time, bleeding time. Can you tell me? Yes, very good, Shantanu. Bleeding time will be increased. Bleeding time will be increased. Can you tell me about the PT and APT? What will happen to the PT and APT? Very good, very good, Manohar, Navin, Sandhya, Saitya, Shantanu, all are getting right answer because it is a platelet disorder, not the clot disorder. It will be normal. So bleeding time, normal. Bleeding time will be long, but PT and APT will be normal. But when you are going to check the platelet aggregation test with ADP, collagen, 
and epinephrine what will be this one very good sandro it will be normal because it is see gp2b3a is normal so aggregation will be normal problem is with addition so what should be the risk to set in addition test positive or negative tell me in one shot very good abnormal means negative sabash i was expecting this right so now you understood that is why i asked like this so risk to set in test is negative negative means abnormal right so this is about the bernard solia disease so examiner will be asking question like this he will be framing mcq like this a patient was having prolonged bleeding time pt abd a patient was having prolonged bleeding time pt abd was normal related aggregation test with adp collagen and epinephrine was normal and risk to set in addition test was negative most likely diagnosis right most likely diagnosis bernard solia disease right Come to the next disorder. That is the von Willebrand disease, right? Von Willebrand disease. There is a von Willebrand factor deficiency. And remember, they are they are autosomal dominant disorder, right? Von Willebrand factor is deficient. And remember, von Willebrand factor most important function is to stabilizing the factor eight, right? Stabilization of the factor eight because of decrease in von Willebrand factor, decrease in factor eight will be also there, right? So now you got the point. Von Willebrand von Willebrand disease. What will happen? Factor is decreased. So that's why that is why factor eight is also decreased, right? So what will be the life finding here? Bleeding time is prolonged, right? Can you tell me what will happen to the PT and APTT? PT will be normal, and APTT will be prolonged, right? And rest of the things. Platelet aggregation test with ADP, collagen, epinephrine is normal. And can you tell me about the risk-to-satin addition test? Risk-to-satin addition test because see, one Willebrand factor is not there. So yes, very good. It will be negative or abnormal thing only, right? So now you can see these are the two leading platelet disorders: Bernard Solier and one Willebrand disease, right? And now you can observe easily that in these two, only one thing is different. Can you see? Only one thing is the difference. That is the APTT. Here it is the prolonged, and in Bernard Solier it is normal. So that is the point I wanted to tell you. Remember, in when I used to write in exam, already exam, that time they used to ask this kind of question, and I am seeing that trend is coming back because these are the conceptual areas where you have to know the addition, what is addition, what is aggregation, what is risk-to-satin, what is risk-to-satin assay. When you know all these things, then only you can handle all these things cleverly in exam. Otherwise, it will be a lengthier question. So be careful, right? So now it is clear how to differentiate APTT. To watch for APT will be prolonged in one platelet disease because factor eight is decreased. Yes, I mean in in Bernard Solier disease, what you are saying is correct. You can see the large platelet also, right? So large platelet can be seen in Bernard Solier disease because of the discussion is going on and bone marrow is forming abnormal. Thrombocytes that is why they will be larger in size, right? And yes, Navin, very good. Small is seen in Scott Aldrich. Scott Aldrich syndrome. Please make a note of that thing which Navin is telling. This is the right answer. This was the question in AIMS exam also. Now come to the last one that is the Glanzmann's autosomal recessive disorder. Here you will see GP two B three A is deficient. Right, GP two B three A is deficient, and GP one B. Now you can see that addition one is the normal. So this is the normal. So what will happen in this lab analysis? When you will see the lab feature of the Glanzmann thrombocytia, bleeding time will be prolonged. Right, PT and APT will be normal because this is plain platelet disorder. But here, when you will see risk to certain addition test, what will be the result? Positive or negative? Very good, very good, Manohar. It will be positive. So risk to certain addition test will be positive, and platelet aggregation test with ADP, collagen, epinephrine, all these things will be abnormal. Right. So that is how examiner will be framing another big question in exam. Right. So that is why I wanted to explain all these things. So probably I have explained this platelet disorders in a nutshell. Tomorrow we will be discussing uh, some important point about the blood banking and anemia. Right. So tomorrow we will discuss from that thing. I hope you all understood. Remember this concept is very important, which I in the beginning I told.